start joining in and then give us an opportunity to share. You're going to see the no BS uh, logo on there. Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> I heard somebody sneeze. Somebody sneeze. That's right. That's right. <laughs> ah, we're coming across. Oh, awesome. I can see. Ready, Captain Dave? I'm ready. And and we are back. <laughs> here I am, Fly Navarro, with the No BS World Tour, sitting here with Captain Dave Marciano from Wicked Tuna. What's going on, Captain Dave? Not much. How are you guys? Good Do, to see you, man. Man, great to see you. Uh, tell me how you're making out with uh, all this lockdown. <laughs> well, I guess the like, same as everybody else, right? We, you know, so we won't complain too much because we know our situation is not new, unique. But uh, it's certainly tough, you know what I mean? Because up here in New England, our charter season typically starts you know, April 15th, after a long winter of not fishing at all, you know, we're, we're not Florida, right? We don't have a year-round fishery. We got four months in the summer to make our charter season work. And uh, we've already lost one month, and we're working on the second month. So it's making us a little nervous. So, uh, but it gives you extra time to work on your boat, and you said you were getting a lot yeah. of work done today. Right, yeah, yeah. I know we've been down the boat, you know, up here – we take advantage of the sunny days when we get them. So we, we've had a nice week of sunny weather. So I've been doing a lot of painting and sanding and, you know, giving her her, her Hollywood makeover, a little makeup job for the you know upcoming filming season when we start filming season 10 in July. She'll look nice and pretty. So while and all, all the haters are going to, you know, won't have nothing to bitch about the boat being a mess or they too many stickers because we ground all the stickers off. So Oh, so you know what? You're going to need a no BS sticker is what you're going to need. There we that, go. Yeah, that, yeah. That. You're going to need it. Yeah. And I might, that, yeah. I, I might even send you one of these crazy little bad boys right there. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I like that. There you, go. you know why? Because you're not the only person with haters. I got plenty of them. Yeah. And so <laughs> uh, while I share this to even more pages, uh, yeah. can you answer us one question who wears more makeup in the show, the boat or you? You say the boat needs a the makeup boat. job. I just the asked you. Okay. For sure. No, you know, it's funny. It's funny you go down that road. So, you know, the, the, when we're filming the show, it's just GoPros and one cameraman on the boat. And it is what it is, right? You know, and again, the haters, every now and then, you know, I, I shave and my beard is all crooked and, right? Like, dude, I'm on the boat for five days, you know, and, and you know, I probably, have you tried to shave with a mirror that you can't see in because it's 35 years old and, you know, probably needs to, you know, so, you know, it's funny, of course, the cameraman don't say anything, they just let it roll, right? <laughs> you know, there's been some scenes, if you watch the show, you know, it's like, they like, you guys are filming me, and you can't say nothing. They just roll with it. No, right? you can have a piece of because food that makes there. You feel. Yeah, <laughs> that looks like it is what it is. You think I care what the fish think I look like? The, uh, the, the fish don't so care. Roll with it, right? and I put up with it. But you know, the boat we like to make look good for our charter clients. And uh, you know, let's face it, because of the show, we're so busy these days. It's hard to find time to do maintenance on the boat, you know what I mean? So she grinds hard. So, you know, in one sense, we're, we're taking advantage of all this downtime to do those million little projects, you know, that have 
they're all a little project. They're all those five minute projects, but it, it's taken three weeks to get them all done. It, they add up. They, yeah, they, they, do. they do. They add up on a boat. So let's right. talk a little bit about how you started in uh, the fishing business. Uh, should I say when did you start fishing? Yeah. Well, look, I had my first job on a potty boat in Salem Harbor when I was a kid. I was about 11 years old, and it was just the local half day. You know, they did the four-hour trips in our local town. And, uh, you know, I was a kid who showed up every weekend with the money I made from, you know, mowing lawns and doing chores around the house, right? Because I was – my dad didn't fish, so if I wanted to fish. I had to figure out how to do it my own. And – uh you know, one weekend, uh, the older kid who used to work in the boat didn't show up. And, you know, the owner knew me from his like, crazy kid who's here both days on the weekends, right, for two trips a day. Because that's what it was just flounder fishing in Salem Harbor. You know, they said, hey, can, I, you know, I guess you could say that's where my career started and I never looked back. There you go. And it all started just because I liked fishing, you know what I mean? Nobody in my family fished before me. You know, my father, you know, he, he never you know, understood my passion for fishing, but he always supported it. But, like, he didn't know nothing. He didn't he didn't even know how to put a worm on the horn. You know what I mean? <laughs> and to this day, right, you know, it, it's funny. It's kind of like the family joke in a sense because, you know, my sisters went to college and they ultimately took over the insurance company that my father built. Right. And over the years, fishermen have thought I was crazy because they're like, what are you doing out here in the middle of January in five degree weather, fishing offshore, making little or no money? They're like, you know, dude, you could be driving a Lincoln Town car into the city every day with a suit and a tie like your old man. And you're out here fishing with us. They're like, are you out of your mind? But those of you who know, you know. Like, that's not a job I could do or you could do, right? No. You can't see me in a three-piece suit every day, right? Not so even if, close. If, you know, that's what's great about fishing. It's not always gravy, but it's not the type of job you do if you hate. It's it's definitely a job uh, for passion. It's definitely a job for passion. Right. Uh, and that's what pushes you through on all those days that are cold, that are rough, that they're not biting. Yep. <laughs> Um, not making no money. It's exactly, you know? exactly. So. so, at what point from working on the drift boat did you go into uh, into commercial fishing? Did I come through on you on that one? I, you cut out a little bit, but I, I think I got the gist of it. Um, so that progressed right through high school. And then I wound up going to bigger companies with bigger boats and offshore fishing on those style boats, those drift style boats. And then, you know, after high school, um, for a few, you know, for I think right after high school, I went to Key West, Florida for five years. And I fished down the Keys on the same potty boats on the Yankee fleet. So we used to go down Florida for eight months and we were in New England for... Um, Four months, you know, and then I got married and had kids and I need to make more money. So I wound up getting into the commercial end of fishing um, and up here in New England. That meant gill netting and dragging and long lining. And eventually I wound up buying my own gill netter, you know, a small day boat. And I did that for years. And it's funny because, you know, tuna fishing I didn't get into tuna fishing because I was a sportsman. We got, we got into it because they were worth money. And it was never something we did year-round. Again, that's, you know, for the past 30 years, the boat is where this household makes 90% of its annual income, right, for the whole household. So I didn't go tuna fishing because it was fun. I did it because it was a paycheck. And if, you know, I always thought, the way I viewed giant tuna fishing was the key to being successful was knowing when not to go. As soon as you couldn't get a paycheck out every single week, it's time to put the nets out or put the lobster traps out or go long lining or do anything but tuna fishing. And uh, and that's a big thing in whether it's commercial or even recreational, knowing when to go out. 
Uh, you don't right. want you don't want to waste time, and especially in your case where time is money, uh, right. you definitely don't want to waste time uh, spending two three days out there burning the fuel, burning the bait, burning everything up. So um, now of your family of your kids, is there anybody else that fishes with you that became a well, fisherman? You know, on the show you see my son who ultimately took over the old boat. If you've been following, we got a newer boat now, but. Um, so he took over the old boat and my daughter fishes with us on the show. And then my nephew has been there forever. And then along with that, my wife and my youngest daughter come out on occasion. All right. Now the truth is too, is, you know, my son will probably follow in the family business and run the boat and stay with it. Right. But my daughter, you know, as much as she likes it, that's definitely not, you know, her final career option. But it's great to see she will step up when we need her. You know, and again, let's let's be realistic. You know, the elephant in the room is, you know, the TV show for us has been an opportunity for in, our entire family, right? Absolutely. It's completely changed my business model. You know, whereas I, I Charters was always a small part of what I did. Look, as a commercial fisherman, I'm an opportunist, first and foremost. When I see opportunity to make money, I go with that fishery. And because of the show, you know, our opportunity is in charter fishing these days. And it will be for the foreseeable future. I mean, that's one thing that the show has given us, both myself and my son. You know, our charter boats are on TV, you know, 25 to 27 weeks a year. That's a great angle any of the any of your other charter boat, you know, that's great with, with marketing. Go. That's how great much, marketing. How much would you pay for that much exposure. Absolutely. Never mind, right? We make a little bit of a paycheck to participate. So, you know, I'll admit, I'm fortunate. It doesn't make me better than I know. There's a thousand charter guys out there, all very good fishermen. A lot of them probably even better fishermen than myself. We were just fortunate to have this opportunity drop in our lap. So. We're rolling with it. That's all. We're riding the wave till it crashes on the beach. Absolutely. Listen, luck is when opportunity meets preparation. That's right. So somebody was asking of, uh, in your entire year, you mentioned that 90% comes from the boat. Uh, somebody, Eric Leach, um, he asked, what percentage in the overall does the tuna, uh, the actual selling of the tuna make in, in your sure. year? Great, great question. Okay. In my old life, right, before TV world, it was probably, I would say, and we're going by averages because fishing is fishing. Oh, absolutely. Great, right? right? It, was, it was probably in the order of 20% of the annual income for the boat, that one species. Okay. 20, you know, let's face it, it's a four-month season, so it's a quarter of a of a year long business when you're a commercial fisherman you fish year round one way or another tuna season was one quarter if we had a good quarter you know it might have been 20 percent of the annual income but you know we made much better money doing other fisheries but it was a summertime fishery that had low overhead and easy access you know you didn't you didn't need a hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of lobster traps in the water you didn't need you know Fifty thousand dollars worth of gill nets. All you needed was a couple of idiot sticks, and you put them on the boat and go. <laughs> I'm stealing that line. Thank you very much. Uh, an idiot stick. <laughs> no, I, 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 that's gonna get some of the some of the guys are gonna get their fences all ruffled. Listen, right? if you Look, don't I piss somebody I, off, I, you're I, not I, doing I, a good I, job. I, the old guys who taught me how to catch tuna, right? You know, uh -huh. we started to use his hand lines, you know, because hand lines, look, even back then, and now we're going back a while now, 30 plus years, you know, back then a good rod and reel, you know, they were just coming into age with the pens and stuff. But, you know, back then a good rod and reel was a thousand bucks. But for 40 bucks, you could set up a hand line basket and catch tuna with it. So, you know, those old guys always called, you know, back then, most of the boats that had rod and reels were the sport boats. So we semi-affectionately called them idiot sticks. 
Well, it's funny. And that stuck with me. <laughs> the The very first time I went giant tuna fishing, I was out of Gloucester back in 1995. Uh, and I was just a young kid yep. using some old uh, Finors where you had to pull the handle out, swap them around just to get it into low gear. Uh, so <laughs> things have changed so much right, right, from right. back then till now. So, uh, and the fishery has changed so much to, uh, from then till now. Now everybody uh, is looking at it because of the show, because of the platform. Yep. It's given it a, a worldwide recognition. So, uh, yeah. Another question is, what is the biggest tuna that you have weighed? 1,200 pounds, 12, roughly. 1,200 right? pounds. Plug, we never weighed it. This was before the show. Okay. The dressed weight, so the plug weight with just the head, the tail, and the guts gone was, um, I think it was 867, right? So that was just the core. I think when we did the measurements... You know what I mean? We measured the girth and the length, you know, while it was whole. Uh-huh. And, you know, back in the day, you know, the guy said, okay, according to those measurements, you know, the formula, whatever they use, we never physically hung it on the scale except for the plug. But, you know, the, the, the according to the measurements, it was, you know, 1,175 pounds. Wow. So as a fisherman, we round up, right? It was a 1,200 you, pounds. You always round up. Except when you're paying yeah. somebody money, then you round down. Um, so the guy, yeah. the guy that I giant tuna fish with, uh, Captain Curtis, he just pumped, he just jumped in here and he said he would love to see you up in Nova Scotia catching one of the giants up there. I, you know, I, I, I'd love to, right? I, Cause I've seen the videos, you know, they have a unique fishery there. You know, we see those fish in the chum like that, you know, I've probably seen fish like that maybe... A dozen times in my career. On a rare occasion, you know, a little more common is to see one or two come right up in the chum or a stray, and it's usually a big one. And, uh, you know, that we see with some regularity, you know, a single fish. But very rare do we see a whole bunch, you know, boiling in the chum like that. Uh, so it is, it does look pretty cool. But see, here's my thing. You know, I get into tuna fishing as a commercial fisherman, right? I have very little desire to put that much effort into something to let it go. Okay? <laughs> if we're going to let it go, I'm not going to kill it and sell it. I'm okay with sitting on the couch with my pajamas on, all right? Uh, now, um, you know, I, I, I say that because, you know, I mean, I've done it a lot. It, it's still, it's cool, it's exciting, right? But you got to admit, it's a lot of work, at least for oh, me, right? It's a now, lot of work. That being said, though, again, like my business model has changed. We do a lot of charters now, but, you know, still I'm making a paycheck from the charter, even though oftentimes we're doing catch and release fishing and the clients love that experience. Um, but look, I'll admit, right, like, you know, that, that whole idea of catch and release fishing. I'm a commercial fisherman, right? <laughs> when we first started doing that, you know, there was a learning curve for me there. You know, keeping fish alive wasn't something I was good at at first, right? Because, again, in my career is, okay, if you can't, you know, when the season shut down and we can't kill them and sell them, well, that'd be the very last day we'd go tuna fishing. You know what I mean? I know. So, I know exactly but, what but you it mean. But it is cool. It is still is cool to see that. But, you know, I've caught my share of giants. And uh, for me, one of the cool things about the show is if any of you follow us on Facebook, right, I've had opportunities to do fishing. Now, you do a ton of it, right? But for me, that was always just a dream to go mowing fishing down in Cabo, right, to go catch a sailfish. You know, I fished in the Keys, and we caught a few sailfish, you know, on occasion when they bit the snapper bait on the way to the bottom, but... You know, in the Keys, we were snapper and group of fishing, but that was the extent of my exotic fishing. Since the show, I've had opportunities, you know, working with Accurate Reels. They've flown my wife, myself and my wife out, my wife Nancy, out to uh, the West Coast and done all that fishing out there. We've gone to Mexico. We've gone to Italy. We've gone to Australia. Um, 
that's been pretty cool. You know what I mean? I know like, exactly it, it, what you it's mean. It's not giant tuna. Everybody's like, oh, you got to come over here and catch giant tuna. It's like, I'm, the cool part is, because those are my dreams as a kid, but then life happened, and I got into commercial fishing because I had a family, right? And those, those dreams, you know, got put on hold, right? So now, because of the show, though, we're walking through doors and, you know, experiencing opportunities like that. So it doesn't have to be a big fish to impress me. I'm still enjoying the fact that I get opportunities to do all kinds of different stuff that I haven't done before. I, uh, I actually spoke with somebody yesterday that said, uh, Peter Grossbeck from San Diego, he said that you came out and fished on one of those long-range trips uh, watching the guys catch the yellowfin over there. Yeah, 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 yeah. We went. I went, again, like that was, I think it was two years ago I did my first trip on the Royal Polaris, right? So that was a 10-day trip. We go to the island of Guadalupe. Now, like I remember when I was a kid, you know, we used to go to the golf course, right, and catch the bass in the in the pond that was in the golf course, right? And then me and my buddy found out that the golfers would give us a quarter for the balls that we fished out of the water while we were waiting around fishing for largemouth bass, right? So I guess that was my first commercial enterprise, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it went from golf fishing balls. largemouth bass to grabbing the golf balls for the golfers. But on the way home, we used to take those couple of bucks we got, and we would go by the used bookstore and get um, used copies of Saltwater Sportsman. I think it was back then. And it, it might have been, might have been Florida Sportsman, right? And so I remember with my buddy, and he's passed away now, but we used to lay in the, my dining room floor at my mom's house and flip through the pages and see pictures about trips on the Royal Polaris back then. And I, that was something I always wanted to do. And again, because of the show, I finally got an opportunity to do that two years ago. And now it's come an annual event for me. How nice is that? Yeah, it's cool. How nice you know? is that? Now, I want to I wanna segue from that into a couple different things. Number one, I just see uh, Trista Evans just joined us with Hooker Electric. She, uh, yeah. I interviewed her this morning, uh, for the, uh, West Palm Beach Boat Show, and she says that you are a big fan of, uh, of Hooker Electric. You guys use it for your Yeah, yeah, fishing. yeah, we have one. We, we have one, um, I had them outfit a Shimano for me, um, and we haven't used it as much as I'd like, um, you know, simply because I'm so busy with the show deal, right? Uh -huh. But I definitely want to do some of that deep drop sword fishing but it's just I haven't had the uh, really the luxury of time which is a good thing it's because I've been so busy with the show I just haven't had a week to go play around you know well listen now you have all the proper equipment ready to go and they're yep. definitely showing up really good up there in the northeast daytime right right right, right. no it's it's definitely a cool thing uh, you know, catching swordfish on a rod reel. You know, I've done the long line in bit and all that, but, you know, catching it with a rod is a pretty cool thing. So the other question I want to ask you this week, uh, I had um, Peter Chabanzai from the Billfish Foundation, and he was ah. mentioning that uh, you do a lot of tagging up there on the, the bluefins that you release. Uh, yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, yeah, and, and look, that's that's, again, that's new to me. You know, be, again, be, because of the show, I'm doing more bluefin tuna fishing now than I ever have before. And whether it's through charters or filming the show or simply commercial fishing, you know, that bluefin number we talked about earlier now is probably 80% of the income for the boat now, right? It's completely flopped around. It used to be a small portion. But, you know, again, on our charters, we have a, um, a great clientele, and they love to do that tag and release fishing. And, again, that's something I would never do before. As a commercial fisherman, once the season closed and you couldn't harvest them, we wouldn't go a single day, you know. Uh, we, we have to focus on something else. You know, usually we put the nets out. 
about that time of year, it was time to start our fall gillnet fishery. But because of the show, we've, you know, and again, and I had to learn how to release fish in good condition. You know what I mean? The first few times I tried it were a disaster, an absolute disaster. And look, I don't mind killing fish, right? I'm not squeamish. Yeah. But but even myself, like, you know, we, we, we did some catch and release fishing, and I knew looking at the condition of those fish that they probably weren't surviving. So, look, I got a conscience. I got, you know, I had no desire to continue to do that. So I reached out to other captains, you know, some actually in Florida and, you know, all around. I reached out to them and said, you know, how do you do it? How, I had to ask that question. How do you release a fish that big alive? You know, it's not a codfish. It's not a bass. And again, it's something as a commercial fisherman was totally unfamiliar to with me because prior to that, if we weren't going to kill it, we wouldn't bother putting a hook in the water. So, you know, I had to have that 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 learning curve in the beginning. And now I think, you know, if, if people have seen our videos, when we release a fish, I know we're releasing a good. It's a good, clean release, and I I have all the confidence in the world that our releases are, you know, long long surviving fish now have you had any fit any recaptures on your tags yet not as of yet no okay no okay that's it's always yeah, a not, not my we've caught and tagged fish but uh we haven't got any of our tags back yet T tell us a little bit about the fish that you've caught that are tagged where do they travel from we the few i've caught and the two over the over the years i've caught and both came from canada Really? Both, both from that, that Canadian fishery, which is, you know, we've known that all along. In the fall, those fish start to come down. I think when they arrive out there, you know, they kind of go outside and then they wind up in there. They're way offshore. And then in the fall, right, because in the fall is when we ever traditionally have our herring fishery blossoms. And it's a, and a herring is a very robust bait fish. And it happens near shore, and it happens in that September, October, November timeline. So that's when those fish start to travel down, because I think they're following the bait. So in the spring, they're offshore, and then they wind up, and we don't even see them in the in the first half of the year. It's not till the last half of the year where we get a crack at them. What is the latest in the year that you've heard them uh, uh, being caught there? Oh, December. Okay. December, right? And, and, uh, and it was Dave on the dot com. We had a few years. Like, I would have never even thought of going. But Dave, you know, because again, after tuna season in September, October, I could always make money gill netting for Pollock. And, you know, that was like the big money making season for my boat. Uh -huh. So I wouldn't even bother because I could make money doing this, right? Much more money than I could tuna fishing. But guys like Dave on the dot com now, and there's always been a fleet of guys like that, and it's not a knock, but you know, they do something else for a living. They have a beautiful boat that's equipped to go tuna fishing, and their goal is different than mine. My goal is to make a paycheck. So I look at fishing like that. They're sportsmen in the purest form. They got a beautiful boat. They their passion and their hobby is tuna fishing, and they're good at it. So they wanted to be the guy who caught the very last fish of the year, right? So, you know, apparently he's done that quite often. I wouldn't even have thought of trying in December, right? But a few years ago, he had a big week one December, that first week of December. Has that changed your thought on fishing in December? No. <laughs> <Not yet. laughs> we, well, look, because that time of year, right? We um, the way the quota works is okay. We have our biggest chunk of quota in the best weather of the season. Now for that uh, November December fishery, we have a very small quota. It winds up being four or five or six days of fishing. You know, it just ain't worth the effort to freeze my ass off. No, right? I, and, I, and again, at this point in my life, again, when I was younger, I did the ten day dragon trips, the fifteen day trips, right? I've probably spent three quarters of my life at this point offshore on a boat. So it's not that I don't like going out there, but 
I'm okay with not going if I don't need, you know what I'm saying? No, nope. like, I agree right? with you 100%. You know what I mean? I, I've done a lot, and I still love to do it, but at the same point, you know, I, I mean, again, I'll, I'll admit, one of the one of the things that I, I, one of the blessings from the show, right, is for the first time in my life, you know, what it's meant for us is after all these years of commercial fishermen, which is, you know, many guys can identify, it's it's week to week, you know what I mean? And you have a few big weeks and you save for the slow weeks. But with all that's happened the past years now with the show, right, it's put me in a position where I can take a day off and not stress about it. You know what I mean? No, that's which is very important. You know, for me, like, that's huge. You know what I mean? Um, I can I can take a day off. I won't say I can relax because that's a skill I haven't learned yet, right? But I can at least I can not stress out, right? Which is now, important. Someday I like to learn how to relax a little, but it's I, to be honest with you, I don't think I've done it, but I I hear it's overrated. Right, right, right. It's overrated. The day that you but, stop, yeah. somebody else is going to pass you. Right. No, you know, for the show, it's it's you know that's like a really cool thing. It's been. I've said it in other interviews, you know, where they've asked specifically what's it meant. And, you know, I guess the best way for me to describe it is it feels like for the first time in my life, I'm getting a little bit ahead in the rat race. You know, we, we always we always managed. We always, you know, got by. But for the first time in my life, it's allowed me to get ahead a little bit. Okay. That's that's fair so, enough. Like, that's a cool thing, you know. That's ne a great opportunity. That's why... When it all started, you know, as far as the show goes, and they asked if you want to do it, the first words out of my mouth is, is there a check involved? I'm a commercial fisherman. I didn't do it to get on TV. I didn't do it for any of the other reasons, right? They said, yeah. I said, so, let's see. I'm going to go fishing for this fish that I'm going to go fishing for anywhere. Anyway, you're going to look over my shoulder with a camera, and then you're going to give me a check when we're done. No brainer. No, even though it's the first few seasons, it wasn't much. But again, for us, it was bonus money, right? At the end of the season, it was like, all right, guys, I would cut the guys a check for, here you go, here's four weeks bonus pay, thanks to the production company. You know, so not life-changing, but a good deal, it, right? Every little bit helps. Right, now, the, the key, you know, and I guess the big urban myth, and I thought so myself, I guess, at some level, was, oh, you're on TV, you get a million bucks, right? It's, being a part of a TV show is like any small business. The key is longevity, right? The law, you know, doing one or two seasons is something, and you get a little bit, right, out of it. But the longer it goes, the better it gets. And now what we do have is longevity. And that's, that's what's put me in the position, you know, the past few years to, like, you know, it's nice. I can I can catch my breath. You know what I mean? I can I can pause and not stress about it. That's and that's a good it's thing. It's a good feeling. That's a great feeling. That's a great feeling. Now, somebody had just asked that swordfish on your wall behind you. Where'd you catch it? I caught that with um, in Florida with Bill Gray with uh, Bill Dobb there. From uh, Gray's Taxidermy. You know, it's we funny. We came down there. He heard I was in town. I'm on the um, board of directors for Gray's Tagging, for their tagging program. And he heard I was in town, so he brought me out on his boat. And we did a day of that deep drop in, and that's what we got. You know, and of course, because it's Gray's Taxidermy, you know, they were like, oh, don't worry, it's coming. Automatic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Automatic. You got them out. Now, tell me, uh, right. how, how did they prepare the fish? I want to know how you ate the fish. Oh, we bought, let's see, we um, we brought some to that Brusco's Italian restaurant down there in Deerfield Beach, okay. right? And they cooked it a whole bunch of different ways for us. And then we shipped some home and we broiled some and we had it on the grill. And, you know, it was good eating. It was it was almost a pumpkin sword. It wasn't quite, you know, a pumpkin, but it wasn't but it quite was orange. Way there. Yeah, really, really so close. It was, it was a, if it was just plain white, I wouldn't even have bothered bringing it home, you know. 
Uh, but it was worth the effort. It was a good eater. That's, it was all, that's just about the right size for eating, too. That's all that matters. <laughs> that is all that matters. Uh, let's see. I, I've got questions. And it's um, just to give you a heads up, uh, we've got people from the Maldives jumping in. We've got yeah. France. I just see Guam joining in. Yeah. Uh, so we've got a lot of different questions, and I'm sorry if I miss some of them. Uh, Samuel Irvine from France, he's a big sword fisherman over there. He wants to know, do you love sword fishing? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It, it is, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty cool, um, especially with a rod and reel. Now, you know, up here, we got to travel 180 miles offshore to hit that edge where they're at. So we need a good week of good weather if we're going to go out there and play. But like in the old boat in the hard merge, I couldn't really consider doing that. With the new boat, you know, now we got the range to do it. And again, I said it earlier, I just need the time. So in the new boat, uh, and for those of the people that don't know, what's the name of the new boat? New boat is the Falcon. The Falcon. And new is the relative term, mind you, right? It's, it's newer uh, to you. It's new to you. Right. <laughs> the hard merge was built in 1984. Uh -huh. And that's a Novi boat, a, cl a classic gillnet lobster boat now the falcon though was built in 1986 and it's a 43 torres built in key west florida okay so um, she's got a little history uh now did you bring her up from florida or no i bought it in the harbor from a guy he was actually the guy i caught my first giant tuna with back on a different boat when he owned the janey b but like when I remember when he brought this boat in the harbor, you know, it had the the fly bridge and all that, right? And he was the one who cut all that stuff off and kind of made it this like express commercial boat, which for my needs, again, I was looking for a boat. I had a budget with the money I saved from the charters I did from the hard merchandise because of the show. And I knew my son would want a boat someday, right? So, I, you know, I saved all the profits from the charters and put that aside for five years. And then I, so I had a budget for a new boat. It wasn't unlimited, but I had what I had because everybody's like, you know, why didn't you, you know, get, when you look at getting brand new boats made, right? They're not yeah, cheap. I could have I gone down that road, but, you know, the thing is, is I don't want to blow. I just told you I got done getting ahead. <laughs> the last thing I'm going to do is blow it on a boat, right? I don't but blame a boat, you. A boat that makes business sense, I could do, right? So I, I stuck with an older boat. And the thing is, is now we have two boats. They're both paid for. They're in great shape. And uh, we got a charter business. It's, you know, and I don't have no boat payments. That's even I better. I don't worry about paying for that half a million dollar rig, you know? Because, again, for me, it's not a knock, but... You know, for me, it's important. If I own a boat, I have to generate income from it. Absolutely. No, I have no aside. There's no other than, well, I guess in some sense, you know, because of the show, I do have that alternate source of income now, if you want to look at it that way. That's definitely a bonus every year to know I can count on that. That's... That's a good thing, but, but again, it's not how you were brought up to right. build a, uh, a commercial business. Right, right. That's just how I look at boats. It's like, all right, how can I make money of it? Mm. Hey, look, I hope maybe someday when I'm rich and famous, I'll be able to get one of them $10 million sport rigs, you know? But uh, uh, one of them fur boats. The hell, fur with, boat the, hell, the hell with being famous. The hell right. with being famous. Just become rich. Uh, That's I, all. I, I was told that when I was 23 years old, I, we were hanging out, having a couple rum drinks on the dock, and one of the charter captains walks by and he says, I remember when I was your guy's age, I wanted to be rich and famous. Now, the hell with being famous. Right, uh, right, right. So it's one of those things I've never forgotten. I've never forgotten. Yeah, yeah I, I could see that. I mean, that's the, I guess if there's any regrets, you know, I was content being Dave the Fisherman. You know what I mean? And, you know, things have changed since then. And, you know, granted, 90% of it, the people are all wonderful, all great, um, you know, things. 
at times it becomes overwhelming because I never planned on being that guy, right? But one thing I've learned is, uh, you know, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. But, you know, that's why maybe hopefully someday I'll get to the point and I'll get, you know, this will allow me to retire and I can let my hair grow in and I'll just fade off into the sunset. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, you already told us about that old mirror and you can't shave straight. So when you get that hair growing back in, I want a picture of that. <laughs> Um, now you got, uh, the, uh, the season's about ready to kick in. HMS is opening up, uh, Ju yeah. June 1st. Right. So we got two weeks and I, I have to just disclaimer for transparency. I'm on the HMS board. I don't know if you, okay. I don't know if you knew that or I didn't not. I know that. No, no. I am, no, I, know you know. I, I, I am on the HMS board. I've been on the board now for, uh, for the advisory panel for five years. So, uh, I know when every single quota is right, being right, filled, right. when it's opening. Yeah, so uh, right. even All with... All the years I was gill netting, right, I was very active in fisheries management. I spent 50 meetings a year with the gill nets and the ground fish and the long line. And, and, you know, after, I think about 10 years ago when they implemented sectors, that's when I walked away from fisheries management in disgust. But that's just my story. So it, you're dialed. It, 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 it's it's not easy. Uh, I know I've been asked to be on ICAT as well because of so much of the international traveling I do with my right. connections I have. I speak right. two languages. Uh, my biggest thing is the time and the politics. Yep. Uh, the, poli right. the, the politics is tough. Uh, yeah. Um, but for at least for me, I feel it's something that I want to do to give back to the sport that's giving yep. me a living. Uh, right. if, if it wasn't for no, fishing, I, again, I, I used to feel that way, Gil Netton, but you know, ultimately in the long run, after decades of participation, the government pulled the rug out from under us, you know, and, uh, you know, we, we lost a lot of, a, a lot of the fleet here with that sectors move, you know, our ground fish fleet went from 1700 active boats to less than 80. Now, for the people that aren't familiar with the word uh, ground fish, could you just elaborate for the people that oh, don't yeah. know? That's that's our bottom fish we have here in New England. It's cod, haddock, pollock, flounders. And when I say flounders, you know, there's no single species of flounders. We have about 27 species of flounders that are commercially viable. So different times of year, different species, different bottom, different depth. But uh, So that's ground fish. You know, just like you guys down south have your snapper and grouper, we got cod, pollock, and haddock. Exactly. I just want, because there's a lot of people that are watching that might not be familiar yep. with that. Uh, yeah. So as you're getting ready, you got two weeks before you start fishing. What are you guys, uh, besides the boat maintenance, I'm sure there's a lot of other things you're getting ready for. What are you getting ready for uh, for this season? What are you doing to get ready? What do you mean? Look, I'm, I'm getting intel where the bait is. But come on, you guys have seen my boats. Do I look that organized? <laughs> All right? <laughs> I'm not that guy. That's, look, we're going to go down the boat with the rods on my shoulder. We're going to hum them in the, in, the, in the cockpit from the top of the ramp. You're right? killing me. <laughs> And we're gonna run out and go figure it out as we go. Come on, you gotta load up with some bait. You gotta load. You, come on. Well, I'm a commercial fisherman. I get all that stuff on the fly, man. Oh, that's always that's always been my edge, right? Because of all the time fishing, and you know, with bait nets and all that, right? I could get bait when everybody said there's no bait. You got that's it. if if there's one edge I had, you know, that was it. You know, you know, and again, it's it's funny. To because of the show, right? It's put me in this position. You know, again, in, in, and I'm a commercial fisherman. I know gill netting and dragging and long lining, right? Really well. Now, I love, I got into fishing because of fishing with my rod and reel. But I'll be the first to admit, like, guys start asking me, you know, all the details, right? Like, I'm not one of those fishing rod connoisseurs right and with you know like guys ask me shit and i have no idea what they're talking about 
But I just kind of fumbled my way through it. And, you know, keep it like like a guy like you, right? Like I follow you. You do a lot of sport fishing, and you, and you have a lot of knowledge about a lot of different things, right? And, like, I, that's not me. But I, I'll, I'll say because of the show, what's great is I'm starting to learn that stuff by fishing with guys like you for the first time in my life. But, you know, guys, I won't say guys, but some folks think, oh, he's on the show. He must know everything, right? <laughs> Uh, you've heard that saying. You've heard that saying. If you can't dazzle them with brilliance, baffle them with bullshit, right? Uh, listen, I'm a firm believer. It's best to stay quiet and let them think you're dumb than open up your mouth and prove you they're exactly. right. Right, right, right. No, no, it's no. Uh, it's a great rule, and I know for me, I'll admit, I don't know everything. But what I've tried to do, I, I was taught a long time ago. You figure out what you're really good at, and you yeah. just practice the shit out of it. You, I don't want to. Right. I don't want to learn how to tie a hundred knots, but I want to tie five of them better than really? anybody else. And I'm just going to outwork, and uh, I'm going to stay out there as long as I can see the bait, or as long as uh, the fish can see the bait, and I'll keep going. And whatever it takes to be the best, I will. I don't there care what go. it is. So, uh, and now it's. Uh, because we're all stuck at home, is talking to a bunch of fishermen every day on Facebook. <laughs> so, uh, Captain Dave, uh, have, is there anything that I've missed that you would like to tell people? Oh yeah, well let's let's at least go. Um, you know, obviously, I got to give the company line. Absolutely, to tune in, tune in Sunday nights, nine o'clock on the National Geographic Channel in the U.S. I don't know the international schedule for all the international folks who have chimed in, uh, but we thank you all for watching. Because of folks like you who watch, it's been an opportunity of a lifetime for myself and my family. And if you do have interest um, in either fishing with us or ordering your T-shirts, hats, or bobbleheads, just go on our website, angelicafisheries.com, and you can find out a lot more about us in both the boats. I, I'm going to order me a bobblehead. I, I, that is awesome. I didn't know you had bobbleheads. That is awesome. Uh, yeah, I know. Funny. It was it was uh, my sister's idea. She she helped me with a website. I didn't know nothing about having a website when this all started. But then I'll never forget, she saw that the Duck Dynasty guys came out with a bobblehead. So she's like, oh, you got to get a bobblehead. And there's a great part. So when you do something like this, the first run, you have to get a thousand of them, you know, after they do design and you have to put a thousand, right? And I'm just thinking, now these things cost me, I think when we did that first run, they were like nine bucks a piece, right? Oh. And we had to get a thousand of them. So I'm going, you know, and this was early on, I'm writing this check for <laughs> $9,000 for bobbleheads. <laughs> For a thousand mini me's. <laughs> and now it turns out they've they've been a great seller, right? But it's just I'm thinking, how am I going to get rid of these things? I I saw me giving those away somehow, <laughs> but uh, it turns out they're a really big seller. Oh my gosh! It's like my little uh, my little face sticker that I showed you earlier. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just yeah. did that so people would. Uh, because uh, I drive people nuts anyway, so you might as well yeah, keep yeah, looking yeah. at me. Um, two quick questions, and I just started thinking about it because you guys move back and forth between Outer Banks and up north. And yep. I know uh, up in New England that you guys are famous for seafood and food. And I've been, I've spent a lot of time in uh, OBX. So what is your favorite thing to eat while you're in New England? If somebody was going to come up, tell them what is your favorite thing to eat. Well, look, it's the seafood here. I mean, I'm a fisherman. I've always loved. I don't mean just seafood, seafood in general. What's your uh, one favorite my, thing? My, look, I would have to say, um, if I have to pick one favorite thing, it's a good steak. It really is. Okay. Because I eat so much seafood, so when I have the time to go to a nice steakhouse. You know, we got the Strega Steakhouse here. Or even if it's getting a nice steak and cooking it on my own grill. I do enjoy those moments 
when I have time. And again, but I consume a lot of seafood just because I'm a fisherman, right? Absolutely. That was all part of it. That to me, you know, that's part of being a fisherman is you get to eat, you know, what we're catching. Uh, and while you're in uh, the Outer Banks, what is your favorite thing to eat while you're down there? Or place? Oh. Well, it would. my favorite place, I guess, would be the Blue Moon, right? And okay. the food's good there. We, we go through their menu. But, I mean, there were several good places. I don't eat grits, okay? I tried. Everybody tried. I'm sorry. I can't do the grits thing or the collard greens, all right? Give me some potatoes and some broccoli. Simple. So when I was the one season I fished out of Gloucester, and I think the place was called either the Chart House or the Pilot House. Pilot House, yeah. And I walked in there. I had uh, a guest. She flew in for a couple of days. It was late because we had been fishing. It was, I don't know, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock. And uh, I had the goatee at the time. I was much, much younger. Uh, but I tanned very well in the sun. And I went in there and I asked for a table and they're like, we're sorry, we're not serving anymore. So I said, okay, not a problem. I turned back around and I heard the busboy say to the, the hostess, she says, you know who that was? That was Hootie from Hootie and the Blowfish. <laughs> Let me tell you, I look like a lot of people maybe, but not who, not Darius Rucker. I'd love to, but I don't look like Darius Rucker. But I'll never forget. That's Hootie from Hootie and the Blowfish. That's a good one. That, that was great. And I loved uh, Gloucester because uh, I, I was a young kid. I went up there, and within two or three days, uh, one thing I learned in Gloucester, they love their fishermen. Uh, they take yep. care of their fishermen. You walk into the bar... They know who you are. You walk into the restaurants. Uh, Christ, uh, there was a, oh, what was the, the ice cream shop? Uh, Holy Cow, I think yeah. it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are they still open? Yeah, they're still around. They're still around. And You know, it's funny, we, you say that, right, about buying drinks? Uh-huh. So I don't really go out much to the bars anymore. I had my fill when I was younger. But, so there's this guy in Gloucester. He looks very similar to me, right? And even he shaved his goatee to look exactly the same, right? So he buys my shirts. He goes down the crow's nest and he sits in the Taurus. He tells them all day long he's me in the Taurus all day long buying him free drinks. What <laughs> power do you, pal? They don't figure it out. Just don't get in trouble. You know what? But, but at the same awesome. point, if anything ever happens, hey, it wasn't me. Uh that is, you know what? That's a true fisherman. He's got the great fish story, and just oh yeah, yeah. He sits here at the crow's nest because the tourists that's where they go when they come to Gloucester, and he wears my shirt. And they, they, you know, I see it. They take pictures with him, just like it was me. He's got them all fooled. That is awesome. That is so <laughs> awesome. Uh, if I, because a lot of people are asking, I think your daughter has shared this on the hard merchandise page. Yeah. If she can go yeah. on my page and put your website so people know uh, okay. wh where to get all your merchandise, that would be right, that right. would be awesome. Uh, that way they can just click the link and they can go ahead and uh, go buy whatever they want or book a day of charter fishing right. with you or ask you a question or. Um, uh, or buy or buy your look alike a drink. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, Captain Dave, uh, again, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank if, you. If you could just stand here for a second, and we'll sign off. And right. everybody, I want to thank you so much. I know this is being broadcast across my five Facebook pages and my YouTube channel, along with the Palm Beach Boat Show. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Uh, also, for everybody that wants the No BS sticker, that little white button right there in the middle, that's the link uh, to the No BS sticker. Uh, I'm giving those away for free. Uh, thank you so much for watching uh, every single day while we've been trying to fill up uh, social media with some positivity in this crazy time of ours. So thank you guys very, very much. I really appreciate it. Captain Dave... Uh, good luck on your upcoming season, uh, both bluefinning and uh, on the show. And um, 
there's a bunch of questions that I didn't get to. I'll try to answer them or I'll tag you in them so you can answer them if you'd like. Sure. Um, sure. But again, thank you very much. And everybody, we will see you tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock, with Dominic Lacumbe Jr. from American Custom Yachts. And thank you so much again. Peace out, everybody. Thank you. And uh, if you're in South Florida, make sure you stay dry because it's definitely uh, raining out there with this tropical system. Thanks, guys.